So, Jackie, the ripple effect from this uh, from these hearings continues. The committee is now formally asking Virginia Thomas, the wife of Supreme Court uh, Justice uh, Clarence Thomas, to, to speak with them. Now, just a few weeks ago, you, you reported that the committee was unlikely to ask her to cooperate in this investigation. So what caused the sudden change of heart here? <laughs> And the sudden change of heart, I believe, is related to that latest batch of John Eastman emails that I had previously referenced. Uh, judge David Carter, um, who is the same federal judge who wrote uh, a ruling that essentially say that that Donald Trump and John Eastman, his co-conspirator, um, committed multiple crimes, including defrauding the American people uh, and tr trying to uh, halt an official proceeding. So those e those emails were only turned over to the committee uh, last week. There were about 400 of them. Uh, and Carter, I believe, said that around 10 of them were especially relevant and important in communications with a high-profile leader. Uh, we know that some of these emails that have been recently reviewed reveal that Ginny Thomas's involvement in the efforts to overturn the election are wider than previously known. And because of that, the committee is now uh, discussing whether or not to explore the role that she played. But that has to begin with um, issuing a voluntary request to bring her in. But previously, I think there there were a number of issues at play. I think the cumulative evidence so far uh, did not cause a majority of lawmakers to say yes. We need we must bring her in. Those lawmakers were in the minority. There was also a fear that it could be a distraction, uh, and that because there wasn't enough evidence, it you know, and because Ginny Thomas is such a firebrand, especially at this very moment in time, because of who she's married to, that it could you know, essentially Trump, the Trump story. Um, but now the, the evidence is really uh, undeniable. And, and you, you saw the committee quickly pivot, even in the middle of their public hearings, as this is a still very much a live investigation, and, and ask her to voluntarily come in and speak with them. Jackie Alamany and Vaughn Hilliard, dynamic duo this early in the morning. Thank you so much for being with us. Joining me now is Democratic Congressman David Cicilline of Rhode Island. He's a member of the Judiciary and Foreign Affairs Committees. And last year, he served as an impeachment manager during the second impeachment of Donald Trump. Good morning, Congressman, and welcome. Good to see you. Good, good morning. Good to see you. So in this week's hearings, uh, the committee appeared to be laying down the groundwork to show that at the center of this insurrection, plot was Donald Trump himself, and I think that's very important. So going far, forward, what elements uh, of the plot are you looking for the committee to explore? Well, I think the committee has done an extraordinary job of really laying out the facts and circumstances surrounding the a set of conditions that led to the attack on our democracy on January 6th. You know, if you remember, Michael, people in the beginning were suggesting, oh, this was just a group of enthusiastic Trump supporters who got out of hand. We now know, of course, that this was financed and planned and executed with the assistance and the leadership of the president of the United States and those closest to him. I think the committee has set that out in very clear terms. Uh, both the president's conduct and those around him were really devised a scheme to keep him in office, although they all knew it was illegal and that he had lost the election fair and square. They developed a very sophisticated scheme to try to keep him in power and overrule the will of the American people. There's nothing more antithetical to our democracy than this. So also during uh, the hearings on Thursday, we heard a great deal about the Electoral Count Act and, and how that bill uh, became central to John Eastman's plan to overthrow the election. So you guys uh, in Congress planning to make that a priority because that seemed to be a linchpin for guys like Eastman to, to execute their plot? Yes, uh, I think, you know, we will, of course, await the full set of recommendations from the January 6th committee, which I expect they will uh, produce when they produce their report. We've already passed a number of reforms to help secure our elections in H.R. 1, the very first bill that we passed. But I think there will certainly be additional work that we will do, and I hope our Republican colleagues will join us in this effort, because it shouldn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican or Independent, everyone has an interest in preserving our democracy and making sure uh, votes count. Of course, this is challenging because we have one party in our country right now is working hard to make it more difficult to vote. They're trying to install secretaries of state who will do the former president's bidding. So this attack on our democracy is ongoing. That's why the work of the select committee is so critical. 
So I want to focus in uh, reaction uh, to the new reporting this week that Jenny Thomas uh, corresponded with John Eastman sometime between Election Day 2020 and January 6th. You tweeted, quote, this is completely unacceptable behavior from the spouse of a sitting Supreme Court justice. Uh, justice Thomas's failure to recuse himself from related cases is inexcusable. It's also worth noting uh, that he's been previously clerked for Justice Thomas. What concerns do you have uh, about this news? Well, I mean, we know that the chief architect of this illegal scheme to keep the president in power and give some sort of legal basis, which, of course, didn't exist, was John Eastman. And we know that there was an ongoing dialogue between John Eastman and Ginny Thomas, who is a strong advocate for overturning the election and um, was the person who led a Facebook group that ultimately met with John Eastman and a series of uh, text messages that the January 6th committee has already disclosed. Um, she's right in the middle of this. And what's particularly disturbing is Clarence Thomas was the only justice who dissented from a unanimous, otherwise unanimous Supreme Court decision, the very critical moment the documents be turned over to the January 6th committee. There was really no basis to to oppose that, and yet he was the lone justice. He, while his wife was engaged in this effort with John Eastman, he certainly should never have been allowed to participate in that decision. He should have recused himself, and it raises real questions about his judgment as a justice on the court, and I think has contributed significantly to a lack of confidence in the credibility of the Supreme Court, which is very harmful to the ongoing work of the court. So this, we need to know more about it. The Select Committee has sent a letter to Jim Salas inviting her to come in. I hope she takes advantage of that and gives them all the information they need. I'd like to switch uh, it real quick in the minute we have left uh, to the work that Congress is currently doing uh, to pass new gun laws. The bipartisan group of senators are reportedly very close to a final agreement. And you, you've got your own active shooter alert act that's headed to the House floor. Tell us about your bill. And if you believe, as, as some do, that there's been a recent shift in Congress that will make passage of new gun, gun laws possible. Well, the active shoot alert is actually a, really a public safety bill that will create a Amber Alert system, much like we have uh, for Amber Alerts for, for missing children or Silver Alert for missing seniors. It will allow local and state governments to take advantage of the federal infrastructure so that you can get a warning on your smartphone or smart device to not go into an area. It will help protect law enforcement. It will help protect communities. It, ha it will save lives. It has the support from the FOP and the Sheriff's Association, District Attorney's Association, a really good public safety bill. But the, the, the effort to reduce gun violence, we passed the Protecting America's Kids Act, has lots of good provisions. I hope the Senate comes to an agreement that includes as much of that as possible. We have got to respond to this very serious epidemic of gun violence in this country. And we you know, banned ghost guns, provided for safe storage, ended trafficking. Uh, made uh, high-capacity magazines illegal. So we did a lot of good things that will make a real difference. Um, we understand that in the Senate they need to get 10 Republicans on their bill, but I hope they will do as much as possible. And I know with the leadership of Chris Murphy, that's what he's trying to do, to help save lives and reduce gun violence in this country. These, you know, our communities expect us to do something that's going to make a real difference. Rhode Island's Congressman David Cicilline, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Still ahead, the war rages on in Ukraine. Three Americans have been reported missing after volunteering to fight alongside Ukrainian forces. President Biden has been briefed. We are on the ground in Kyiv with the latest. Then, a somber Juneteenth in Buffalo, New York. The community is still reeling after 10 people were gunned down at a local supermarket. The city's 47th annual Juneteenth event will honor those lives lost. And right after the break, inflation is not just hitting you and me. It's crushing small businesses across the country as well. More on how it's affecting their bottom line. You're watching Velshi on MSNBC.